they didn't have the second quarter of the immigration program. So it might be that UK, if, if the UK does leave, it might be that they will save some money. But the thing is, if, if UK leaves, which all happened, the, the new tariffs and new trade deals with the US, with China, with India will emerge. And it will cost you a lot more rather than staying in you in EU. If, if you stay in EU, EU will take take care of the, all the deals, tariffs and regard, all, all the issues regarding the import and export to the UK and uh, out of the UK. So the, this, is the, this is the first one. So it will cost you a lot less staying in EU. The second point about the immigration, the immigration part is that the core point of view is the free movement of trade, labor, and goods and services. So if, let's say, some Bulgarian builder from Bulgaria moves to the UK, it's like, and some UK citizens complain that they don't have any jobs or things like that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Remain campaign. Please, you have the floor. So, 
we, we have already. I will. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, I, I already just simply forgot how many times actually we have already heard this argument about the uh, democracy deficit in the EU. We know that the EU is not perfection, EU really has gone through some evolution and still has to go through some evolution. But the issue is that there are already some institutions that have been established here. And we've got the European Commission, European Parliament and the Council of yeah, the European Council over there and the Council of Europe. And in the Commission, if enough attention had been paid there, it would have been seen that those coming those commissars themselves have already been actually sent there by the EU countries themselves. These people are not really appointed out of nowhere. And in the Cabinet National and some other commissioners themselves had been actually sent by the UK itself. So if they had paid attention to that, they would have really noticed that. The other issue is about the European Parliament. And the European Parliament, there are elections. And the last time, in 2014, when the elections had been held there, about only 40% of the people had turned out in the votes. And the UK people made their choice and just almost decided to send some great delegates, like the UKIP delegates over there. And whose head, Nigel Farage himself, didn't really appear in the meeting or about the fisheries more than 40 times. Mm -hmm. And when there were very, very, very strong concerns actually about that. So when you actually elect just some of the far right people who themselves are against it, the European Union's ever existence, who themselves out of quite quite interesting reason happen to be actually in the European Parliament. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. First objection to the latest argument that the UK doesn't have any benefits from the EU, EU. That kind of makes the whole the rest of the arguments invalid. Um, but um, my colleague mentioned here about the war. Um, if you want to talk about war, let me remind you that the EU was proposed by founding fathers of you of Europe slash Winston Churchill back in the 40s and was strongly advised and backed by the United Nations that was found after World War II. And I mean I don't say that the UK there's always a gentle size on the boat, let's say that both terms, but to be in subjective that manner is just not kind of acceptable. And let me liberate the numbers false once and for all. If you're talking about 15 billion costs, if you're talking about a country with a GDP of 14 billion and more. So just make a comparative analysis there, cost benefit analysis, look at the scales, not enough numbers, but the margins. I guess the rest of the problem will be solved by itself. Thank you. Makes, uh, Britain more uh, gives greater protection and makes it more safe. Uh, Britain is secure, but not for forever, uh, obviously. And at this uh, unstable time, time of terrorism and insecurity, there is no thing more important than the partnership. And the partnership comes to trust. Uh, and the Brexit, the Brexit uh, campaign actually shows the lack of trust. So how are we planning to fight against terrorism, fight against ISIS, if we do not trust each other? So that's my question. Exit. So this is that were stated from the opposite side of us. Would like to be fully responsible for our security. It's not about keeping security, but it's about how we want to provide the security. Um, I just want to point some legal points about the referendum. This is actually is not legally binding, so it's up to the government to start the process or not. And uh, another point is that. We saw a lot of people change their minds about staying or leaving the day after the referendum happened. So we would like to have another referendum in the whole country uh, to decide over this uh, stay or leaving. Thank you. Your side? Okay. Sorry, to the distress issue again, I'm going to mention that there are a number of countries within the EU and and the UK is only one of them, um, despite the fact that it's one of the most important and uh, developed countries, but it is only just one minority of the EU. And when taking into consideration the regulations and decisions made by the EU, it is uh, just, uh, it's just cannot be fair most of the time. And taking into consideration the conditions within the EU, only from the European Parliament is elected, other uh, else are appointed. And uh, e uh, when coming to the decisions made by the EU, it cannot be applied to the uh, UK directly because the UK uh, can be abused by other European countries because it's the uh, economy and the growth of the economy, and other countries can use its sources without any. Uh, 